Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what are we talk about? Well, I want to continue with the methodology in action. I'll follow up a couple of on a couple of recent positions, talk about free rolling and how markets are markets, and that'll all make sense in a few minutes. For the mind to trade, I want to continue with the wisdom of Jesse Livermore. I also want to, as I have been doing too, not just give you some quotes, but throw in my two cents and talk about how I disagree or mostly agree with what he does. Housekeeping, I do take requests. It makes my job a lot easier. You can send them to davelander.com slash contact. If you would like to join me live each week, usually on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Central Time, you can go to davelander.com slash webinar every Thursday, usually unless there are technical difficulties or on holiday weeks, I usually take the week off. But most weeks, I do a webinar and it's still live. So bring your questions, bring your favorite stock picks. would love to have you there. If you want the slides from this presentation, all the other presentations combined, a bunch of other stuff, go to daveliner.com slash stock charts and put in your information. Twitter at T following moron, YouTube at Dave Landry is the rest of my contact information. All right, let's talk about the methodology in action. No mystery charts this week. I haven't found a lot of setups lately. There's only been a few. So let's talk about those. And then, of course, once we start getting setups again, which I think we're getting really close to because I have a lot of stocks that are rallying nicely. I could set up really, really soon. So once that happens, I'll go back to showing the mystery charts, just in case you wonder where they were. And usually the mystery charts are straight from my trading service, so there's no hindsight in these charts. Anyway, so the core methodology of the swing to intermediate term trading, and along with a, a hybrid approach to the money and position management, is really the secret to longer term success. And within that, the free rolling, getting a position, and the worst that could happen to you, barring overnight gaps, of course, is a break even. That's really the secret to trading. All right, so this was a little pullback we talked about recently. Entry was there. And about a week or so after I was in it, when it hit the IPT, I wrote in the week of charts, the next big thing, question mark. Well, since then, it rallied nicely. And then once you get to the initial profit target, you bring your stop up to break even. And then once it moves more and more in your favor, you trail it, but you trail it a little bit more loosely manner now people say are you using a moving average to trail your stops and the answer to that is no but it will sort of look like a moving average over time with the only exception that it won't go up if the market doesn't do anything whereas sometimes a moving average due to the drop-off effect will keep heading higher so you can see like right here and right here and right here the moving average kept going higher and higher so my stop on these days here would have been probably right around here and then as it moved higher and higher that stop trailed higher and I eventually stopped out. If you go in and watch some of the older shows that I did both here and especially on my own YouTube channel at Dave Landry, you can find a lot of setups in the money management. So we'll, we're not gonna get into the weeds on that. Anyway, this is what I call a better than the poke in the eye trade. I was actually profitable on the second loaf too. Here's the trades, as you can see, I didn't bet the form on this. I only put a thousand bucks up and then it paid off 200 bucks, which is 20%, which is what I call a better than a poke in the eye trade. Now, ideally, I want to be in a stock or a crypto for a long, long, long time. Now, these better than a poke in the eye trades, meaning that you at least get the initial profit target out and begin to trail that stop a little bit, can keep you in the game and you make a little money while you're waiting for the next big winner. So that's one of the secrets to success. The real secret to success is sticking with positions longer term because that's where the real money is. And that's something that Livermore talked about quite a bit in chapter eight of Reminiscence. And we'll get to that in just one second, chapter nine too. Now, this was the original setup here and I'll show you where to get these in just one minute. But you can see the buy was at 26.90, the stop was at 21.50 with an IPT of 32.30. That's initial profit target. When that's hit, remember we take off half of our shares and we move our stop to break even. Now we will move the stop a little bit, sometimes close to a fairly one to one basis. So if the stock goes up one point, we might bump that stop one point. I've been a little bit more lenient in recent years. But once the initial profit target is hit, the point I'm trying to make is let's say you're looking for, in this case, five points four points once you're up 5.4 points if that happens on a spike intraday then you want to immediately bring that stop up to break even otherwise we just adjust the stops every day tighter not looser based on where the stock closes anyway we take a look at the chart like i said last couple of weeks 
it was in a decent trend nice landry light above the 30 ema and then it pulls back to the ema and that creates a pattern i call or a setup i call a landry light pullback years ago i called them daylight pullbacks if you have the layman's guide to trading stocks you'll notice in there i called them daylight pullbacks but now i call them landry light pullbacks this stock was in a gradual uptrend it's also a relatively new issue still kind of an ipo still some excitement behind it and you can see it began to accelerate higher that's a pattern i call accelerating momentum strategy and also it was very very persistent and i have a pattern i call persistent pullback so it's a combination of these things i spent 30 years working on the pullback and i have a few little variations and sometimes two or three of the variations will set up within one pullback. So this is kind of a combination of all three of those setups. Anyway, entry was here, stop was here based on that spreadsheet. And the initial profit target was up here. You can see it did hit that. So again, our stop comes to break even once we hit that IPT. And again, we will also trail it a little bit. So we might have bumped it up. I have to check the records, but we might have bumped it up a little bit when the stock began to rally a little bit before the IPT. But definitely on the IPT, if that's hit intraday, you want to immediately bring your stop up to break even now i exited a slight bit early and i had a few more shares so instead of the thousand dollars we were looking for per 100k in my model account that i take trades to mimic what i suggested a trading service i made 9.98 on that loaf and there's a the trades down there as i showed last couple of weeks i just felt like it had made a really fast move really quickly so i went ahead and bailed out i think i got out on this day towards the high because it was closing in on the ipt now, if you want to see the archives of this, as I say each week, go to davidlandry.com slash archives, and this was on 5.4. This is a good exercise, if I say so myself, and you're going to see what I recommended warts and all, and this is 100% free. If you want to see the positions live, and I'll also give you a free membership to the website if you sign up, you have to, you have to pay for that. <laughs> But you can learn a lot for free by looking at the archives to get a feel for things. All right, let's hop back into the mind of trade. As I've been saying last few weeks, I'm pulling mostly from reminiscence from a stock operator. I'm going to use the biography for a little color commentary and a little background. And initially I said I wasn't really nuts about how to trade in stocks. But as I'm rereading it, there is a lot of good stuff in there. So I'll pull from that one too eventually but right now we're focusing on reminiscence and we're at the end of chapter eight and the beginning of chapter nine now when we last left off livermore felt there was a bear market coming and he was right but early which is the same thing and he blew up one more time one thing that's a little confusing about reminiscence of a stock operator is he does kind of jump around a little bit it's hard to follow it from a, a chronological standpoint anyway now getting to chapter nine you want to have an opinion on the markets but you want to make sure that the tape confirms that opinion this is what happened i didn't wait to determine whether or not the time was right for plunging on the bear side on the one occasion when i should have invoked the aid of my tape reading i didn't do it this is how i came to learn that even when one is properly bearish at the very beginning of a bear market it is well not to begin selling in bulk until there is no danger of the engine backfiring so you want to make sure again that tape confirms my wife often asked me i think i said this last week she's like dave you're often right but early is there anything you can do about that and it's like well you know i am waiting for confirmation i'm not just shorting a market at brand new highs i'm waiting for it to roll over and in the case of the buy side, I am waiting for it to begin to rally off lows and I am looking to play that first pullback. But sometimes I get stopped out in that first pullback or that first rollover. And then, of course, the big move comes afterwards. So that's how I'm occasionally right but early. I'm not right but early by fighting the market. I'm right on my opinion, but not necessarily the exact timing on that there's one or two more fake outs that happen before the real move ensues and the market's job is to fool the most amount of people and frustrate the most amount of people and as i often say and i borrowed these from linda rasky she she told me she probably got them off the floor but it's the corollary to that is the market will often do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people and will also do the most obvious in the most unobvious manner so if a market is going to rally a lot of times they have a hard sell-off first something like a tko type of move the trend knockout move and then begin to rally so it's okay to have an opinion but wait for the tape to confirm 
and be patient. The succession of spankings I had received made me less aggressively cocksure. Perhaps I should say less careless, for of course I knew I was just so much nearer to the smash, all I could do was wait watchfully as I should have done before plunging. So when you feel like the market is coming to an end, like in 1999, we knew it wouldn't last forever, but the market kept going up. And the people who tried to short it early got absolutely decimated. They were right, but early. Now, you need to learn from your mistakes. And that's in trading and life, obviously. If a man did make mistakes, he'd own the world in a month. But if he didn't profit by his mistakes, he wouldn't own a blessed thing. Now, this kind of brings up the point of the argument of Churchill versus Einstein when it comes to trading. Just because you lose on a trade does not mean you did the wrong thing. But if you keep losing, then maybe you are doing the wrong thing. And that's the tough part of trading. So Churchill says success is going from one failure to another without any loss of enthusiasm. And that's how I have been for the last year or so with the trend following. And it's been really difficult because there really hasn't been a trend to follow. Now, I think we're all a little guilty of the definition of insanity by Einstein. It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. It's like we, we start digging ourselves in a hole trading, maybe day trading or some sort of hyperactivity, trying to dig ourselves out and the things only become worse. So there's a lot of introspection in trading and you're really going to have to learn from your mistakes. Now, Livermore talks a lot about how he sees mistakes as assets. And my wife says, you'll do that once. Like one time, for instance, this was after my first daughter was born. I was in a bit of a panic. I'd, I'd never had a kid before, didn't know what to do, whatever. And so I ran out to get some food or whatever. And I ran to the ATM and I left the card in the ATM and it got sucked in. When I got back, it's like, oh, I can't find my ATM card. She says, well, it probably got sucked in. And she's like, you'll do that once. And so <laughs> now whenever she screws up with something, sometimes I'll say, you'll do that once. And she kind of growls at me a little, but she gets the point. So anyway, I write YDTO a lot in my trading journal when I do something really, really stupid. So you really need to learn from your mistakes. Now, he did begin to short the market, but this time the speculation had gone absolutely crazy. The market was pretty much going straight up back then in the early 1900s. But he did wait for the market to crack before he started putting on a lot of positions. In fact, he actually ended up buying a stock and it didn't work out. And then he shorted like no tomorrow. And we'll get to that in just one second. It was very curious how, after suffering tremendous losses from a break of 15 or 20 points, people who were still hanging on welcomed the three-point rally and were certain that the bottom had been reached and complete recovery begun. One day, my friend came to me and asked me, have you covered? Why should I, I said, for the best reason in the world. What reason is that? To make money. They've touched the bottom, and what goes down must come up. Isn't that so? Yes, I answered. First they sink to the bottom, then they come up, but not right away. They've got to be good and dead for a couple of days. It isn't time for these corpses to rise to the surface. They are not quite dead yet. It kind of reminds me of Monty Python. Not dead yet. <laughs> now, a couple of random thoughts on that. What's interesting is people... In general, don't sell a stock while it's dropping unless they're eventually forced out. Now, one thing he sort of alluded to, and he said a couple of days, but sometimes it might be months or years. If you do have a stock that sells off really hard and bottoms out for a long, long time by going sideways, sometimes a lot of the players get shaken out through tax law selling, through, God forbid, death and estate settlement and marriage and divorce and all these other things that happen in life. But as a general statement, people tend to sell stocks on their way up. They tend to hold on on the way down. Now, sometimes you'll get like a short covering rally and then the market will roll right back over. And that's because some of the people that were previously long the stock will begin selling it as it begins to rally. And of course, the shorts will pile back on. Now, again, he shorted the market, but this time he was a little smarter about it. He waited for it to crack before he began to short it. At the same time, I naturally prefer to seek and hit the soft spots instead of attacking the more strongly protected specialties. My tape reading found easier money for me and other stocks. I've always played a lone hand. I began that way in the bucket shops and have kept it up. 
It is the way my mind works. I have to do my own seeking and my own thinking. But I can tell you, after the market began to go my way, I felt for the first time in my life that I had allies, the strongest and truest in the world, underlying conditions. They were helping me with all their might. Perhaps they were a little trifle slow at times, bringing up the reserves, but they were dependable, provided that I did not get too impatient. So you definitely want to stick with the trend. Once you are able to get on, I hate to say elusive, but it could, it could seem quite elusive at times, getting on that nice trend. But once you get on that elusive trend, then you need to stick, stick with it for as long as it moves in your favor. Now, it doesn't happen every day. If it did, you'd never see my fat butt again. But every now and then, we're able to get that swing trade off and able to free roll and then maybe get two, 300, 400, or even five or 600% out of position. And that's where the real money is. Sometimes that makes your entire year. Now, as far as holding on to positions, I wanted to return back to that sim that we talked about earlier. Now, two lessons in this, because it didn't just trigger and go straight up. It triggered and immediately rolled over. So the lesson that I wanted to provide here, sort of a side lesson, is unless you're stopped out of a stock, stick with it. And you can see that we took a pretty big, sp big spanking. So that's the $1,230 loss per 100K. Now, it did rally, and at this point in time, we were up 2,000, and following the money management, when you hit that initial profit target, you bank half of that by selling half of your position. So we banked 1,000 there. Now, it was kind of exciting. About a week or so ago, this thing was really rallying up, and we had open profits of 1974, and remember, we did bank 1,000, so that'd be 2974. But then notice what happens. It implodes and gives back nearly all of those gains. So now you're down a thousand from the open profits. Now it's hard to give up those open profits. We all tend to mentally monetize them. Think about what we could buy with that money. And we kind of feel like that money is ours. And you gotta be careful because that could put you into a, a negative spiral from a psychological standpoint, because as I've said quite often, a negative observation or a negative emotion has twice the impact of a positive one. And many times we'll have huge winners and in the end we give up some open profits and clients will complain because we gave up too much money. But the bottom line is that was one of those aforementioned 100, 200, 300, and even sometimes 500, 600% winners. The bottom line is you made good money overall you just had to give up some in the end. And as I often say, all trades will eventually get in badly. And I've told my clients over the year, look, I'm, I'm sorry this trade has upset you. Send me all those profits. Just keep a couple hundred dollars out and go get yourself a massage, help you forget about it. But send me those profits and then let's just pretend this thing never happened. And in 20 something years of doing this publicly, nobody has ever sent me any money based on that. I have gotten tips though, so. I will say that, but uh, never when uh, open profits are given up. It just comes to the territory. It's something you have to live with. If you read Curtis Faith's books, a book, The Way of the Turtle, and also read Curtis Faith's book, Trading from the Gut, but I think it was in The Way of the Turtle that he said that Eckerd and Dennis, specifically Dennis, I believe, was okay with giving up open profits because that came with the territory. He was a little bit more concerned about someone not following the system and being stopped out but not actually honoring that stop. Now, one thing that Livermore is talking more and more about, remember, he started in the bucket shops where he was day trading in and out, in and out, in and out. And he was able to do that because he was getting an instantaneous quote. It wasn't necessarily a real quote, but it was a quote he could trade off of. He could see the trends developing. And once he got to New York, as we talked about in, in the first one, he ended up with losing his money and he had to go back to the bucket shops and that happened a couple times because it's a little bit harder to trade in real markets as opposed to a bucket shop that was bucketing the orders and giving him precise fills. I cleaned up. Great Northern Preferred had gone down 60 or 70 points in all their stocks in, in proportion. Just a little backstory on this. The railroads started offering stock to people with a, a discount to where you could borrow money and then buy the stock for a lot less than the actual stock price. And that was one of those signs of the end of the, the trend, the end of the speculation. 
And again, you don't just short these railroads because they're doing this. You wait, of course, for the mark of the crack. I made a good bit, but the reason I cleaned up was that I figured that the decline had discounted the immediate future. I looked for a fair recovery, but it, I wasn't bullish enough to play for a turn. I wasn't going to lose my position entirely. The market would not be right for me to trade in for a while. The first $10,000 I made in the bucket shop, I lost because I traded in and out of season every day, whether or not conditions were right. I wasn't making that same mistake twice, and that's... One thing that you'll find with me, if you're following along on my trading service, there are going to be weeks and months and sometimes longer where I'm going to bore you to death because there's nothing to do. And other times we just sit tight in a position and let everything unfold. Being right and sitting tight, as Livermore says in one of these other chapters, is not necessarily an easy thing. So Livermore occasionally, and this is probably a good thing. I don't do it at all <laughs> for the most part, but I probably should. After he makes a lot of money or he runs into a lot of issues in the market, to clear his head, he would go fishing and he would go down to Florida. Now, while he was fishing, somebody had brought a newspaper out to the yacht on a powerboat and Livermore saw that the market was rallying, but he was still bearish. So he cut his trip short to return to the broker's office. It just seemed like the speculation had run rampant. Now, although he was bearish, Anaconda Copper was going up, so he bought. He pointed out that stocks tended to keep going up once they passed the century mark, 100, 200, 300, for instance. So he felt that if it crossed 300, it would head to 340. And he went on to say that timid people don't like to buy a stock at a new high record. Now, I am a pullback player as a general statement. I do tend to wait for pullbacks. I do trade a little bit of breakouts in IPO. So I am buying the high there. And when crypto is really running, crypto goes from 1995 to 1999 in one or two days time. Right now, crypto is not doing so hot, but then next week, crypto might be taken off again. And sometimes you could just buy the highest ranked pairs based on the day over day percent change. Not relative strength like RSI, but relative strength relative to the pair itself. But a lot of people have trouble paying up for a stock. Phil's, for instance, the best Phil's, and, and Livermore talks a little bit about Phil's too throughout this book. But the best Phil's, sometimes you're going to find, or your worst Phil's, let's say you go to buy a stock at 10, you get filled at 1050. You're like, oh man, I've got kind of screwed on that. Well, before you know it, it might be 11, 12, 13, 14. So that, that really bad fill could actually turn out really good. Not all the time, obviously. If it's something thin or whatever, then that's a different story. But let's say it's a big liquid stock. And everybody's trying to pile in. Well, that bad fill can be actually a godsend because that means that the market is really moving. Now, he had strong opinions, but he learned how to be more loosely held with them. That's an old stock market adage. Strong opinions, loosely held. When you want out, you want out. If it, Anaconda, reacted, it meant that precedence had failed me and I was wrong and the only thing to do when a man is wrong is to be right by ceasing to be wrong. When I gave the operator the order to sell, it was 305. I felt certain that at that very moment, the price at which the stock was actually selling on the New York Stock Exchange in New York was less. That if anybody had offered to take the stock off my hands at 296, I would have been tickled to death to accept. So he thought this Anaconda was going to go to 340, and, and he really piled on, and, and he piled on in such a manner that could have blown him up once again. So that's an issue that, that's kind of a reoccurring theme with him. What happened shows you that I am right in never trading at limits. So what he's saying is don't use a limit order and say, I want to get out at that 301 price. Well, before you know it, it's 296, then it's 290 and then and so on and so forth. And I've made that mistake more than once where I'm chasing a stock and I'm using limit orders. I no longer use limit orders unless I'm trading options or taking partial profits. In, in both of those cases, a spike can really help you out. For instance, this morning I had some long puts on the XSP and the market spiked down. I had orders to sell half of them at a double and I was able to get a free ride on those, so to speak. Anyway, getting back to this. Suppose I limited my selling price to 300. I'd never have got it off. No, sir. When you want to get out, get out. And the same thing goes for getting in. If you want in, get in, provided, of course, you have a signal and a trigger. Whatever moves fast always appeals to me. I have learned patience on how to sit tight. 
but my personal preference is for fleet movements. And Anaconda was certainly no sluggard. My buying it because it crossed 300 was prompted by des the desire, always strong in me, of confirming my observation. So he bought it on strain. Well, that's it for this week. Next week, we're going to talk about how Livermore returned to New York because he was very bearish. He wanted to be close to the market. And at one point, he was pounding the market so hard it possibly could have destroyed the markets. Again, if you need to reach me or you want to attend the live webinar, here's all the information. And I want to thank everybody for watching and may the trend be with you.